Today on Applied Science, I'm going to show you a demo of this giant glass diffusion pump. This is a specialized piece of vacuum equipment that's usually made out of metal, but this one is made out of glass so we can see how it works on the inside. And so in today's video, I'm going to show the details of that, why you might need a diffusion pump, and then also connect it up to a homemade cathode ray tube that I made out of some lab glassware. The diffusion pump works by boiling some fluid in the bottom here, and the hot vapor from this boiling travels up the middle of the pump and gets shot out these jets, so it's forcing the fluid vapor downwards uh, toward the outside of the pump here. Uh, and the way this works is it pushes the gas molecules out, so the input is actually at the top here, where we want the best vacuum to be, and the output is over here, where the ends of all of these vapor jets are. So this is very similar to like blowing away dry leaves with the spray from a garden hose. Almost exactly the same thing. You basically want to push the leaves away, or the gas molecules away, and we're using a stream of something to do it. Um, it they're, they're deceptively simple. There's no moving parts on the inside. All of the work is done entirely by these moving gas molecules, or by these moving vapor molecules of this special fluid. So in the early days, they actually used mercury. Uh, because that actually happens to have a really convenient boiling point and mercury is heavy, so you want something that's going to push those dry leaves out of the way, so you want something fairly massive. Um, obviously, boiling mercury is not so great, so nowadays we use either silicone oil or even just hydrocarbon oil that has a boiling point that's just about right. So let's back up for a minute and think why we would actually want to build a vacuum pump this way. Like, why wouldn't we just use a better and better mechanical vacuum pump? When you think of vacuum pumps, this is probably what you think of, a mechanical pump. And these all work in the basic same way, and they work very well, but only down to a point where we hit a fundamental limit. It's not actually a technological limit of building better seals or anything like that. It's actually fundamental, and I'll show you why. So pretend that uh, the plastic beads in here are the air molecules, and we want to evacuate this jar of them. Um, to ignore gravity, I'm going to hold this thing horizontal and shake it around to sort of simulate the motion in there. And the way these mechanical pumps work is all the same. We basically want to connect something up to this volume, make the volume bigger, withdrawing some of the gas, and then expelling it, and just doing this over and over to pump it out. So let's give it a shot here. I'm just going to put this on with some tape. And to ignore gravity, I'm just going to hold this horizontal. Obviously, we can't tip it like this, because that's cheating. We're using gravity. So I'm going to hold it horizontal and try to shake it randomly and withdraw some gas. So as you can see, not surprisingly, we got some in. So we can, you know, disconnect from that. And those are the gas molecules that we got out. Now, let's try this again, but only have one gas molecule in here. Okay, so we've got our one molecule in there now. And we'll connect up in the same way. Shake this thing around. And if we withdraw the plunger, nothing's happening. It's not pumping out. So let's, we could even disconnect this. And it eventually comes out, but it took a while. And that's the key thing. You could basically have the best vacuum pump in the world and connect it up to here. And if there's only one or two molecules in here that aren't colliding with other gas molecules, all you can do is wait for the random chance collisions to basically collide with the walls and the gas molecule will eventually work its way out. Let's try that again. We'll put in one. I am trying to shake it randomly, and it takes a while, but it eventually comes out. So when you're dealing with super low pressures, all you can do is actually wait for the gas molecules to bounce their way out. And then your vacuum pump actually becomes like a collector. Like you basically wait for the molecule to come in. And then the only thing you can do is trap it or push it out. There's no point in sort of pulling anymore because the molecules aren't forming this continuous sort of fluid. So as you can see from the demo, this pump does have a design problem. It's got a small mouth. So you can see the body of the pump is good. It's a large diameter. Uh, but the restriction up here is a pretty big problem. I mean, this, the body of the pump could be connected to deep space, and we still wouldn't be able to pump everything out of here in a good way because of this restriction. So th this pump really is made much more for demonstration than actual use. And if we look at real diffusion pumps that are made for you know, serious work, uh, they're made out of metal, and the mouth is, in fact, as large as the pump diameter. In fact, it's as big as it can possibly be. And the cool thing is this scales up very well. If you have a huge vacuum chamber, like the size of a room for, you know, huge production jobs, you can build a diffusion pump that's also as big of a room, as big as a room, and it still works the same. 
So then the question arises, why do we need two pumps? Why can't we just build a diffusion pump that's big enough to handle the whole job by itself? And I think that fundamentally there's no reason it can't work. Um, but think again of the dry leaves analogy. Um, blowing away dry leaves works great if you just have a few of them on the ground. But imagine if you had 10,000 tons of dry leaves all stacked up in a pile. The size water jet you'd need to push them around is, you know, way outside of practicality. So I don't think there's a fundamental reason. It's just technically not something that's really done because it's just not efficient. Let me show you the internal structures of this vacuum pump and then we'll fire it up. At the top here we have a cooling coil with water running through it. And the purpose of this is to catch uh, vapor molecules that aren't well controlled by the bottom of the pump. So we're boiling vapor in there, we're boiling this oil, and we expect the jets to keep it very well controlled and condensed down below. But if any of that oil makes it up into our experiment, that'd be very bad. It would actually poison or contaminate our vacuum experiment. So this cooling coil up here is kind of a backstop, a, a safety of last resort. If some of the oil gets up here, the coil actually makes an optically opaque barrier between the input and the pumping area of this pump. And so if any of these stray oil molecules go up there, remember at these super low pressures, the molecules hit the walls before they hit another air molecule. So if we make something that's optically opaque, then they have to contact the cold coils and get condensed before they make it out of the pump. Next, there's a cold cap. It's basically an upside down cup that has cooling water also running through it. And the purpose of this is to keep the top of that vapor column cold so that, the, again, the vapor doesn't become uncontrolled. Remember, we've got a ton of heat coming up here, thousands of watts potentially of hot vapor coming up here. And if we just had a piece of glass at the top, it would quickly become as hot as the vapor, of course. And then we might have a molecule that sort of wafts its way up. So this cold cap is another um, invention to make sure that the top of the column stays cold and all the jets stay focused downward. Next we can see this pump actually has a total of four pumping stages. There's one right below the cold cap here, and it has the largest area. So basically everything between the wall of the pump and this cap is sort of inlet to the pump. And then the next stage is here, and it's a little bit wider. And then the next stage is here, and it's also a little bit wider. And the reason for that is each one of these stages has a compression ratio, just kind of like in a jet engine, where the, the compressor blades get larger and larger in diameter as the compression gets higher, as the density gets higher and higher. Um, and eventually down at the bottom of the pump, we have a relatively high pressure. And the fourth stage is actually right here. There's another jet that's gonna be shooting out tons of hot vapor this way. So once the pump has moved most of the gas molecules down to here, the last stage blows them this way and that pushes them out this way and out the pump. And then it has these two things which are also um, oil traps. I guess the idea is if there's a little bit of oil vapor that makes it this way and hasn't cooled off by the time it gets out to here, again, this is optically um, opaque. A gas molecule traveling this way has to contact the glass at these low pressures. Um, I think, I'm not exactly sure how these work, but it does manage to catch a little bit more oil before it makes it out of the pump. I should also point out that this whole section of the pump is, is water jacketed. So there's actually two layers of glass here with water constantly flowing through here. Again, the amount of heat that's gonna be going into this thing is massive. And so the amount of cooling also has to be massive to keep this thing from melting down. We're going to power the whole pump with this tabletop burner. These things are great. It's a real gas guzzler. And so it puts out a lot of heat, but be sure and buy extra fuel at the store. It's just uh, butane fuel. And the mechanical pump that we're going to use is that large orange pump that's on the ground. So I'm going to turn that on first and let it run for about five or 10 minutes to get most of the air out. And then we'll fire up the burner and get the rest of the air out. So one thing that's interesting, when we first pump down, it looks like it's boiling, but actually what that is is dissolved gases coming out of the silicone oil. So I haven't even turned the burner on yet. Just lowering the pressure in there means that there's a lot of gas coming out of that fluid. I think it's actually a unique property of silicone oils that they're just able to dissolve high amounts of gas. This is why you have to degas uh, silicone casting resins. So we'll let this thing run for another few minutes. The bubbling will have stopped and then we'll turn the heat on. While this thing is warming up, I have another funny story about this pump. I actually bought it a year ago for my mass spectrometry video and had a super difficult time getting it working. I had it hooked up to the chamber with a vacuum gauge and no matter what I did, no matter how much heat I put into this pump, I couldn't get the vacuum gauge to read low enough. It wasn't pumping. 
turns out totally operator error. I had a, a plastic tube connecting the vacuum pump, this diffusion pump to my mass spectrometry chamber. And I thought for some reason that the plastic wasn't gonna be a problem, but it really is. In these high vacuum systems, it was outgassing fast enough and the restriction was high enough where even though the pump was working, it couldn't actually lower the, the pressure in the chamber to decent levels. A combination of restriction and outgassing. But anyway, what I was gonna do is take this thing outside and put it over my foundry burner and it was gonna be a do or die moment. Either the thing was gonna start pumping or it was gonna melt or implode or something, but we didn't get that far. The point is that I tried this with all kinds of different electric burners. I had hot plates, I had um, cooktops, I had induction heaters, everything, and I couldn't make it pump and I assumed it was a problem with the heat. But anyway, I'll show you the instructions for this pump too. Uh, you need to translate them and luckily I used Google Lens with pretty good effect to get most of this out and then a kind person on Twitter helped me with the rest. They claim that this pump is 800 watts, which I, I don't believe. I think it requires substantially more than 800 watts to pump properly. Uh, maybe even like two or three times that much. In fact, what I'm going to do is crank this thing up all the way now that we're kind of warmed up. And I've noticed that to get this thing to pump properly, it pretty much needs to be full tilt. Um, this, this particular gas burner needs to look like about like that to get decent pumping out of it. So it's almost ready. As you can see, the vapor line is rising higher and higher. It's already dripping out of here. And then we'll do a time lapse so you can see the rest of the pump warming up. So you can see the last jet is almost working. There's still quite a bit of condensation happening in the column. And in another minute or so, that inner piece will be so hot that there's no more condensation happening inside the column and that top jet will start working. And at that point, the pump is fully operational and pumping as fast as it can. You can see the lower jets are already working and there's a huge amount of condensing oil here. So you can't see the jets, of course, because they aren't droplets, it's actually just vapor. But as soon as the vapor hits this cold wall, which is kept cold by the flowing water, it turns back into liquid oil and drips back down to the bottom, which is what this, uh, this uh, fluid is here. And then this last jet is pretty active too. There's a huge amount of vapor coming this way, condensing out here, and then flowing back into the pump this way. The water chiller is a refrigerated unit that I got off eBay and have used for lots of different things. It basically consists of a refrigerator, a cooling coil, and a pump to move the water around. Okay, so now that we're pumping and at proper vacuum levels, let me tell you about this cathode ray tube that I built. I used a Erlenmeyer flask and I coated the bottom on the inside with some phosphor. And I got this phosphor from cleaning uh, that electroluminescent paint that I've showed in previous videos. And I cleaned it by washing it in solvent repeatedly so that I got just the powder out. The rest of the paint has a bunch of polymer binders and things, but I didn't want that. I wanted just the powder, the phosphor itself. So I let that dry on the inside and made this nice phosphor coating. And then for the electron gun inside there, I used a, a tiny light bulb where I crushed the glass envelope and I'm just using the tungsten filament itself. So we're going to try this first with just plain tungsten. And with the focus in the state it's in, it's kind of hard to see what's going on. Oh, there we go. I'm driving those deflection coils with a signal generator and my audio amplifier to power those coils. And I wound the coils to be about, you know, six or eight ohms or something pretty close to a speaker. As you can see, the deflection's not very big. It's only about, you know, a couple of centimeters or something like that. And the reason is that those deflection coils have to be pretty far away because of the shape of the flask. Normally a CRT neck would be fairly narrow at the deflection area, and it makes it easier for the magnetic fields to get a good deflection. One thing I've always wanted to try is to make a barium emitter. So I mentioned that we're using pure tungsten here and uh, I basically just took a light bulb and crushed the glass envelope and we're using the tungsten filament directly to boil electrons off. 
But as it turns out, tungsten is a pretty lousy emitter of electrons. Barium is much better. And so what we're gonna do is put some of this, which looks like bacon on there, but it's actually barium carbonate and heat it up in vacuum. And what'll happen is some of that barium carbonate becomes barium oxide. And then that's a much better emitter of electrons, like a thousand times better than tungsten. So we should get a much brighter spot for a given amount of thermal energy that we're putting into that emitter. The downside is that once you've done this barium treatment, you can't ever expose the filament to atmospheric conditions again. I think because the water in the air reacts with the barium and makes barium hydroxide, which is not a good emitter. So this is not a problem for commercial cathode ray tubes where they're sealed up at the factory. It's a perfectly sealed glass envelope. So you can have something that's sensitive in there. But something like an electron microscope, it's not gonna work because you have to keep opening the microscope to atmospheric. So those use pure tungsten emitters and apparently give up this thousand fold increase that you could have with a barium emitter. So let's see if this works. The filament burned out, so I'm gonna try it again. Well, as you can see, the experiments with the uh, barium carbonate are kind of hit or miss, so we're gonna have to experiment with that in a future video. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting. See you next time. Bye.